people will move money from stocks into gold when they feel that the stock market could potentially come down. There is only one unique time when they run in tandem to the upside, and that's when the Federal Reserve is flooding the country with money. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. 2021 one ounce silver kangaroos for only 380 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is Gary Wagner from thegoldforecast.com. Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure as always. Good to see you. It's great to see you. And I'd like to first talk about Powell's speech. It seemed like, you know, Powell was saying saying that, yes, they're going to uh, probably taper by the end of the year. But we saw stocks hit all time highs and we also saw gold and silver pop a bit. So what is your perspective on his speech and how markets reacted? Well, first of all, I think he did an excellent job considering the tightrope that he needs to walk and the current economic scenario we're facing since the pandemic, which is how he started his speech by saying it's been 17 months since it started and we've gone through a whole lot and he covered a lot of ground. But the key takeaway that I took was that he made a clear and defined separation between the timeline to begin tapering and the timeline to raise interest rates. And he differentiated them as having different criteria with the interest rate hike beginning uh, being a much more stringent kind of stress test as to what he would need to see. And the reason that was so important, if you recall back to about 2013, that's when we went into QE3, Operation Twist. It was right before they began to unwind a lot of things. They also raised rates at about the same time. So back in the minds of most investors, the onset of tapering means that the interest rate hikes are very, very close. By differentiating them, what he allowed investors to perceive is that interest rates will remain where they are, which is virtually zero, at least through 2022. And that is what I think propelled gold and silver higher and also equities higher because the most interesting aspect when you look at the, the two asset classes is typically there is a negative correlation between stocks in the U.S. and gold and silver because they do different things. And when the stock market is running, typically you do not see gold running at the same time to the upside. In fact, it runs, but in an opposite direction. People will move money from stocks into gold when they feel that the stock market could potentially come down. There is only one unique time when they run in tandem to the upside, and that's when the Federal Reserve is flooding the country with money, adding huge amounts of liquidity and keeping interest rates low. And that's why we saw all-time highs in the NASDAQ, all-time highs in the S&P, and gold and silver have substantial gains. And that's where I think he got it right, differentiating between when liftoff occurs for tapering and liftoff for an interest rate hike. That's very interesting. He differentiated between the tapering of the bond purchases and then the interest rate hikes. So do you think that is correct to really differentiate those? Do those two things actually have a different impact on the economy? Well, absolutely. Um, interest rates are really the, uh, the nail in the coffin of any kind of upside rally in U.S. equities when it becomes more expensive to borrow. When you look at gold, the same thing. If interest rates go up, gold is not attractive because it doesn't have any kind of return. And fixed income assets, such as yields of U.S. debt, become more attractive. Now, tapering is a whole different story because when they taper, we have now seen the Federal Reserve take a, uh, a balance sheet from about, uh, well, it was up to uh, $4.5 trillion at the end of uh, 2013. They reduced it to about $3.7 trillion. They said, well, wait, that's having an effect. And so what happens is when they tapered and raised rates at the same time last time, 
the perception is that, that that's how it's going to be. But there's a big difference between raising interest rates and tapering in terms of the net effect on companies in the U.S. and Canada and the net effect of tapering. It, it, it's not the same thing. So it is a big difference in terms of how the markets will react. The Fed's announcements, should this be bearish or bullish for gold? Well, you know, I've heard analysts say that a tapering's bullish for gold, and I've heard other analysts that say it's bearish. I'm not really sure. I think it's more neutral because all it's doing is providing massive amounts of liquidity into the system. Now, in the case of our current um, asset purchases, he's devoting a lot of money out of that $120 billion each month. 80 of it's going to U.S. debt and 80 is going to mortgage-backed securities. And the interesting thing, that's what's keeping the housing market so hot, refinances so hot, is because it's so inexpensive to borrow money. And so that's different than when you raise rates. When you raise rates, that hurts uh, almost things across the board. And so the key is whether or not inflation is genuinely transitory. I happen to have a difference of opinion, but I believe that Powell's a lot smarter than I am. So uh, if he says it's transitory, that's what they're betting on. And why that's good for uh, gold and silver traders is if he believes it's transitory, they're not going to be quick to pull the trigger on raising rates because really the most effective way the Federal Reserve has of uh, dropping an inflationary rate is to raise interest rates. And so when you hold off on that, he, he's letting interest rates run hotter. And the question is, how high will they go? Have they peaked out? And whether or not the majority of the inflationary pressures are transitory, or as we call it, sticky, they'll be here for a while. And only time will tell what the answer to that question is. And what is your forecast for gold in the coming months and also for silver? Well, silver made it through a big hurdle in terms of a technical level that it had to surpass, which it did today. I was much more bullish on gold than silver. However, yesterday for our a premium subscriber service, we issued a trade alert to go along both gold and silver. In terms of gold, we have different areas of resistance. The first one comes in at around... Uh, 30 to 4, call it 1830 to 1845. Above that is 1866. Above that, we start to get into major resistance, which is 1900, a key psychological level. And what I call the brass ring right now is 1920. And that's the former high that gold ran to before the huge drop. So those are the levels I'm looking at. In terms of silver, we have some resistance at about 2450 and then we have more resistance that will come in at about 25 and 2550 so those are if gold and silver continue to move up that's the first assumption we have to kind of put down for for these numbers to be important those are the levels i would look at for some kind of potential pullback if they barrel through them we just go to the next level that we're looking at and these levels are typically based either on fibonacci retracement or key tops and bottoms in historical data, where, where the market found support before or resistance before. That's how I look at different points of resistance in a market that's running higher. So that, that is my short-term outlook. I am extremely bullish on gold. I am bullish on silver. And there's key points we need to see it break on a technical basis. But on a fundamental basis, the Fed will not reconvene till the FOMC meeting in September. Prior to that will be the next Labor Department's U.S. jobs report. If that number comes out anywhere close to what we saw in July, which was 900 and I think 43 million new jobs added, if we get a strong number like that, that will signal to the Federal Reserve that it's time to really push the button and begin to taper their asset purchases. Now, when we say taper their asset purchases, what we have to understand is they have now swelled their balance sheet to about $8 trillion. So all they're saying is we're going to buy less of them. They're not even talking about reduction of the balance sheet. They're talking about buying less. And that's a key element you need to focus on also. We were just uh, talking on the phone before this interview, and you were talking about how this 
idea of just expanding the Fed's balance sheet and the quantitative easing and this whole Keynesian experiment, um, as it's sometimes called, shout out to TF Metals report there, I'm calling it a Keynesian experiment, but this is really unprecedented. This hasn't been done before. And that's actually one of the most bullish reasons for gold. Why well, absolutely. I, you know, one of the, one of the stories that I talked to my subscribers about is the relative value of gold really hasn't changed that much over time. And the example that I use is you can go back to the 1800s when you could have a gold certificate, $20 gold certificate, or a $20 gold coin. And each were convertible. You could have the same a buying power with either the dollar bill, the $20 bill, or the coin. In fact, you could get a night at the plaza, you could buy a nice suit and a steak dinner. In, in, so you could spend a weekend in New York for $20, either gold piece or a $20 um, currency piece. Now, let's take that to today. The $20 bill is not gonna buy you a whole lot. You might even get a couple of cups of coffee, but you certainly can't get a room at the plaza. You can't buy a nice suit. You can't eat a steak dinner. But when you take the $20 gold piece, just in terms of the value of gold at about 1800 $1,800 will allow you to buy a room at the plaza, a reasonable suit, and a steak dinner. So the buying power really hasn't changed in gold. What has changed is the relative value of currencies. And when they moved to a fiat currency, that is when it really began to tumble. And that's when we saw all kinds of reactions because of that. So yes, gold is a stable commodity. It intrinsically has value. It has had value for thousands of years, first form of currency ever. And it continues to maintain that kind of high status as being relatively safe. One of the consequences of this inflation that you mentioned is sometimes it can get out of control. I mean, we've seen this steady inflation, which has really reduced the value of the dollar. Ultimately, at this point, you know, about 98, 99 percent if you value it against gold. But if it gets out of hand, sometimes the currency can lose value very, very fast and we can end up in hyperinflation. Now, in the 20th century, we saw many, many instances of that. We've continued to see around the world instances of hyperinflation. And you actually in your family ha had experience with the Hungarian hyperinflation, if you'd like to share that story. Well, certainly. And, and first of all, we've got to qualify that the times we've seen hyperinflation have typically been after the major world wars one and two, in which it in attempts to rebuild a uh, country that was bombarded and buildings have collapsed, uh, they would just print money. And that is what led to the hyperinflation. And the story you're speaking about that I shared with you on the phone uh, prior to this interview is that I don't know how it turned out, but it, it seems as though the history of me being a gold analyst stretch, stretches back multi-generations. My grandfather was a large gold trader in Hungary uh, during World War II, and they had a place where they bought and sold gold as well as they made jewelry. And my mother worked at the shop, and she told me the story of the hyperinflation in Hungary, which took me years to really get and fathom the repercussions. But she told me that there was a day my grandfather left the store and left my mother to run the store. And people started lining up to a point where they were out of the front door and lined up down the block. And they were coming in to, to exchange their Hungarian currency and buy gold. And the, she had the, the biggest amount of sales she had ever seen. And my grandfather walked in and looked at the crowd going around the corner, looked at all the money sitting on the shelves that my mom had been taking in, and he turned white as a ghost. He looked at my mom and he says, what have you done? And she was, well, look at how well I've done. And he turned around and he said, okay, business is shut down. Everyone left the store, he closed the door. He says, I don't think you realize, but the money that we have is relatively worthless and the gold that you sold is maintaining the value. And the way she described it to me is it got so bad that it literally took a wheelbarrow full of cash to buy a loaf of bread. That's hyperinflation. You mentioned how a lot of the hyperinflations in the 20th century happened after World War II. And th those were very um, specific circumstances where hyperinflation could really happen. 
Today, I mean, we do have the coronavirus pandemic, and we've seen a whole lot of money printing because of that. I think it's somewhere around you know, 25 to 40 percent of all dollars ever created, like the base money supply was created last year. So y- your perspective on that is hyperinflation a possibility today in the U.S.? I don't know is the first answer, but I don't think it's as probable as what we saw occurring after these major wars. Is there a potential for it? Yes, but we also have safeguards. And what I mean by that is if inflation runs to a certain level with interest rates set at zero to 25 basis points, a quarter percent, if you want to kind of bring inflationary pressures down, you raise interest rates. And so there are checks and balances with the Federal Reserve and the level of acceptable inflation um, that they can do. Ultimately, we're living in a world with fiat currency. And that changes the dynamics of everything because it's backed by faith in the government that issues the bill. And really, that began, as we spoke about on the phone, Nixon put the final nail in the coffin in 1973 when he outlawed the exchange of currencies by foreign countries to be redeemable in gold. And that was when we had completely gone off the gold standard, because between, say, 1930, when FDR confiscated all the gold from all the American citizens, melted it down, which allowed America to become the richest country in the world, we were on a gold standard which started to change dynamically after World War II. But between World War II and what was called the Bretton Woods Agreement, in which although normal citizens couldn't exchange dollars for gold, countries could. If you had a million dollars in U.S. dollars in your country, you can send that to the U.S. Federal Reserve and they will exchange that for gold. That ended in 1973, and what that meant is that currencies worldwide became fiat. They became only the value that you have faith in that government itself that is printing the money. And so those are the dynamic changes. Since then, yes, we're printing a lot. What are gonna be the repercussions of that? As you said, this is kind of an experiment we've never handled economies like this where to get out of a recession, we try to prop up the the, uh, GDP by printing more money, by making it available, by letting companies run. This is something that's relatively new. And when I say relatively new, I mean the last hundred years. And so how the outcome is really an unknown, because in my eyes, you've got to pay this money back. I think our national debt is getting near or top $30 trillion. And if interest rates get raised, we're still servicing the debt, the interest payments on that national debt. And so they can't really raise rates too much without really putting their ability to be solvent, make those payments. And that is the, that's the scary scenario that that I think of. And, And if you recall Janet Yellen, Our uh, Treasury Secretary spoke to Congress, I think about two months ago, and she urged them to raise the debt ceiling because she wouldn't be able to make the October payments that are needed to keep our government uh, fiscally sound or solvent, I should say. That's the word I was looking for. And so they will have to raise the debt ceiling to account for all of the spending. And now we've got a $3.5 trillion infrastructure bill that Biden has put forth, and add that to the $4 $4 trillion already spent on fiscal stimulus, we continue to throw money at the problem. And the outcome is either going to be where we work through that or we don't. And if we don't, I don't even want to think of the ramifications that we have. So I prefer to be optimistic about it and say, we'll figure it out. But these are unknowns. And the unknowns are what makes gold and silver investment uh, such a safe haven asset that that defines it to me is that gold and silver have historically held value for thousands of years. And there's not a currency that has when they began to print too much of it. I think another thing is that it's not just the U.S. It's all around the world. Governments are doing the same thing. And that has never happened before, where every country is on a fiat monetary system. 
not only that, not only there on that all of the currencies are fiat, but it's kind of the devaluation. We, we speak about how much the dollars devalued. And when we say that intrinsically, we're saying against a basket of other currencies when we refer to the dollar index. But it's almost a race to zero because all of the countries are printing enormous amounts of capital, not backed by anything. And when the proverbial stuff hits the fan, how are they going to deal with it? Because even uh, Chairman Powell said, and I believe this could have been four or five months ago, he said it's absolutely uh, a known fact that the current path we're on in terms of what we're spending and what we're taking in is unsustainable. And that's the point. You can't do this forever. And at some point, uh, as Barry Commoner used to say, a, a famous economist back in the 70s, 80s, there's no free lunch. Something will account for it. All right. Well, Gary Wagner, thank you so much for your time today. Before that you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where people can find you online? They can find me online at thegoldforecast.com. They can look at our weekend review, which is not a premium member uh, service on our YouTube channel, which is The Gold Forecast. And it's available for no charge. And we've got an archive that goes back to 2009 of videos that we've produced every day. Gary, once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. All right. Thanks for having me. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. 2021 one ounce silver kangaroos for only 380 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.